Middle school teacher voice still works. Wow, this is so cozy and intimate, isn't it? Welcome to the third annual Nevis Evans Social Justice Lecture Series. I'm Mary Gender Nalek Cooper. I'm the Dean of the School of Education here at Sonoma State University. And I have two tasks now that I've gotten you all in your seats. One is to welcome everyone. And the other is to thank all the folks who have helped put this evening together. And I will be quick about that um, so that we can get on with the lecture. I also have to make a couple of announcements. If you're in Sociology 201, please be sure to sign in at the end of this evening's lecture so that you get credit. And please know that tomorrow's class session has been canceled. <laughs> For the rest of you who are gainfully employed, work is still on tomorrow. We'll be here at 8 o'clock. Please also know that if you leave the building, you will not be allowed back in. However, you may use the restrooms and come back in from the foyer. Please make sure right now, this is you, Bart, that, you, <laughs> that your cell telephones are turned off, that your text messaging is put away, and that there are no flash cameras, please at least for the duration of the lecture. Appreciate that. Wow, this is like being a Morris D's groupie. And while I know our topic is serious and compelling, this is a very enjoyable event on a university campus to spend an evening with 400 intimately interested individuals in the issues and topics of social justice. Faculty, staff, Students, of course, members of our community, administrators, everyone who has an interest in this truly compelling issue. And I appreciate all of your being here this evening. These are the folks, though, that I need to thank in a more specific way because they really did make this possible for all of us. And I will be quick but sincere. The Heritage Lecture Series of the Center for Culture and Gender and Sexuality Studies and the director, Bonnie Sugiyama. Associated Students Productions, Bruce Berkowitz. This is like the Oscars. The Sonoma Student Union Corporation, Instructionally Related Activities Fund, the School of Education, particularly the staff that keep me on track, Pam Van Helsema and Kristen Boland, the School of Social the School of Social Sciences and my dear, dear colleague, Elaine Leader, the Dean of the School of Social Sciences, who is ill tonight. Woo! Okay, we got to be honest here. Elaine Leader is the instructor of Sociology 201 that was canceled for tomorrow. So part of that applause is you'll connect the dots in any case. But Elaine is not with us this evening, but she was an intimate part of the planning for this evening and is, and is always a champion of this work. And I especially want to thank Andrea Nevis and Bart Nevins for their commitment and their generosity in making this happen. <laughs> Andrea comes to all of our meetings, whether in person or virtually, from wherever she's traveling the globe and helps us organize and plan these events so that they serve our students and our community well. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce the Provost and Chief, Chief Academic Officer, Vice President for Act Academic Affairs, Dr. Eduardo Ochoa. Thank you, Dean General Nally Cooper. Welcome, everybody. Good evening to this uh, wonderful event, wonderful occasion. It's great to see you, all of you here. And on behalf of President Armiana, uh, I extend you uh, my welcome to this great event. And I'm also uh, tasked with introducing to you um, Professor Andrea Neves, who is going to introduce our speaker. Uh, Professor Neves has uh, as a, uh, graduated from Stanford University in 84 and then came to Sonoma State and was an instructor, a professor of education for 20 years, and uh, 
then uh, as she uh, entered retirement, it's hard to, hard to believe that she's retired, but uh, she and her husband then were very generous in setting up this uh, social justice lecture series to try to bring um, uh, uh, in, an influx of these kinds of concerns into our curriculum. And it, it's, it's heartwarming for her and for us to see many of our classes here, um, freshman year experience, sociology 201, et cetera. So um, I'm not going to hold up any longer. I'm going to now uh, welcome Andrea Neves to the podium. Andrea. Actually, I was here for 33 years. That's a long time. I joined the faculty in 1972. And I see some of my colleagues here. Uh, Joe Brombaugh's there, right? Yeah, uh, Phil Northern. Am I missing? That have uh, since moved on from Sonoma State, as I have. <laughs> but uh, one never kind of leaves Sonoma State. If you've got it, an experience at Sonoma State, you kind of stay here. And that's uh, what this is about. My husband and I, uh, Bart Evans, had um, thought what we might be able to do at Sonoma State that might have a, an impact, a long-term impact. And so we endowed this social justice program, of which part is this, this um, lecture tonight by Morris Deeth. Uh, in the past, this is, Morris is the third of a series. The first person that we had was Jonathan Kozel. Some of you, I see some heads shaking, uh, uh, heard Jonathan Kozel. The second was Lonnie Guineer. And now the third is going to be Morris Dees. And we're very, very fortunate to have someone of his caliber and someone of their caliber to come here to Sonoma State and talk to us and share with us their life experiences. Um, as far as Morris is concerned, for those of us that had been part of the civil rights movement in the 1960s and 70s. He is a person that is well known to us. And um, some of our gray-haired participants here, and some of us that aren't so gray-haired because we do other things, uh, <laughs> are very familiar with his work. Uh, for those of you who aren't, uh, you know, please familiarize yourself with him because he and the um, Southern Poverty Law Center have had such a tremendous impact on our lives, lives our lives that you may not even be aware of, um, the impact. He was an unlikely, unlikely person to have such an impact on the civil rights movement and such an impact uh, as an advocate of social justice because he was the son of an Al Alabama farmer and he was a grandson of a Klansman. Okay, Ku Klux Klan. That's something that maybe uh, some of us weren't aware of uh, before. However, he overcame all that experience. And he um, initially was um, the owner of a publishing company. He attended a law school at the University of Alabama. And he was part of... Uh, initially, some small cases, if Morris tells me correctly, that had to do with civil civil rights issues. And uh, but one thing that bothered him was the um, was the fact that Washington may legislate, but the South and other parts of the country may not initiate, may not comply. It's one thing to pass a law; it's another thing to implement it. And that always bothered him. And he hadn't been that directly involved until he was snowbound in Cincinnati Airport. And having been snowbound in Cincinnati Airport myself, I know what that's like. And he, while he was there, he had an epiphany. And that epiphany led him to uh, change his orientation in life. He sold his company and he became an advocate of social justice issues. He ultimately founded the Southern Poverty Law Center that has, it's a nonprofit organization dedicated to seeking justice. 
and he's won several awards to that effect, and is known for his legal pursuit of the Ku Klux Klan. As a matter of fact, at one point, I don't know if it's still the case, but at one point he managed to uh, win such tremendous lawsuits that they had to sell off their property in order to pay some of the judgments. He bankrupted the KKK. Okay? Now that's, that's profound. Um, the Southern Poverty Law Center is also known for those of it, us in education as the um, purveyor, uh, publisher of Teaching Tolerance. If you haven't read the Teaching Tolerance uh, issues that come out uh, twice a year, please do so. They're free. Log on to their website. Uh, you know, subscribe. Uh, get the curriculum. It is phenomenal. I've used them in my courses in the past and in the present, and I have found them to be extremely helpful. So if those of you that are planning on going to education, this is one website that you really want to be a part of and um, continue. They have anti-bias projects. They also have, um, actually, they also have grants. So if you're in K-12 education, you might uh, at one point uh, apply for a grant for anti-bias funding for programs. Uh, he has been, he's won several awards for his social justice work, and um, I guess he will share with us, hopefully he will share with us some of his major cases. There are so many I can't, other than the Ku Klux Klan one, I can't even begin to, um, to tell you all of his casework. So he's the chief legal counsel for the Southern uh, Poverty Law Center, and please welcome uh, with a s huge applause for Morris. I should have known that I was in California and I wouldn't need a coat and tie. <laughs> Definitely wouldn't need a tie because I think I'm the only one with one <laughs> in this place. So that's great. Uh, <laughs> now, thank you for being here and thank you for sharing this evening with me. And I'm certainly happy to share it with you. Thank you for the kind words and your family sponsoring this program. The things that you said about me were not things I did by myself. We have 165 people that work at the center, have had several hundred in the past come and go, students, interns. We have 29 lawyers, educators, writers, investigators, and you name it. And in addition, our support wouldn't be, our work wouldn't be possible without the financial support of about 300,000 people scattered around America who contribute to us, and, and many of you here tonight. And as you know, as you were uh, doing this introduction, you're talking about growing up in a small town. I was sitting out there thinking what I might say, and you, you jogged my memory a little bit. All of us have, you know, mentors that could be a parent, could be a teacher, could be somebody you look up to. And while you was talking about growing up in that little farming community, I was thinking about one of those mentors that I have. She was my fifth and sixth grade teacher in a small three-room school. The school is gone now. She taught my father, she taught me, and she taught two of my sons. I think they closed that school to get rid of Ms. Vera Bell Johnson. <laughs> but she, and she wanted us, and a lot of students went on to be pretty good folks who had her as a teacher. She taught several of us in one room in that school, the cotton farming community. And she, she, she had two things she felt that was essential that we do if we wanted to grow up to be good citizens. And one was that we should not smoke cigarettes. 
And the other one was, we shouldn't drink alcoholic beverages. And she actually was my Sunday school teacher, too. And I did great on the first one. <laughs> and I promise you, had each of you in this room and the rest of America had Ms. Vera Bell Johnson a teacher, there would be no tobacco litigation. Nobody would die of cancer from tobacco because you wouldn't smoke. Because every morning, I mean, for the two, and a, two or three years that I had her for a teacher, we had to say this little rhyme. We had to say that tobacco is a filthy weed, and from the devil does proceed. <laughs> it picks your pockets and burns your clothes and makes a smokestack of your nose. <laughs> but on, on, this, on this drinking thing, she's more serious. In fact, she had a button about this big around she wore, and I'm sure she got it when they had the Prohibition Amendment to the Constitution, because I know Ms. Johnson led the forces down in Alabama in that Prohibition Amendment, and on this button it said, lips that touch wine shall not touch mine. <laughs> I, I, was in, I was in class one day. I was in class and I was only like 12 years old, maybe the lawyer to be. And she was going on about her not drinking stuff, you know. And, and, uh, but I said, Ms. Johnson, you told us last week that Jesus in one of his miracles turned water into wine. And she said, yes, Morris, but we'd have thought a lot more of him if he hadn't have done that. <laughs> but you know, she, every morning she led us out in front of that school with the other teachers in their classrooms, all 60 students at that school. And we had a flagpole there, and it was a ritual to raise the flagpole. And we put our hands on our hearts as we pledged allegiance to the flag. And I remember so well the words that have stuck with me over the years. Words that she repeated to us in class because she had another goal, and that was for us to be fair to all people. The words were, with liberty and justice for all. Another mentor of mine is the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. He's from my community and ended up being a preacher of a small church there in Montgomery, Alabama at a very significant time in history. Dr. King was a man that, to ensure America lived up to its promises of equality, he had to face a lot of people in his own race who had no, no vision. He had to face politicians with no backbone. And finally, he faced a terrorist with no conscience. And when he faced that terrorist, he wasn't the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King that you think about that broke down the barriers of segregation. He was in Memphis, Tennessee, protesting and marching on behalf of the absolute least among us, the garbage workers that work for the city of Memphis. Because not only did he believe in liberty and justice for all from a racial standpoint, he believed in liberty and justice for all from an economic standpoint. And the night before he made that last talk that's recorded that he made, speaking to a group gathered trying to get the city of Memphis to pay these people a living wage. He made a speech that we probably remember him for, and when he said that, I've seen the promised land. I've been to the mountaintop, as he would say in his very eloquent way, and I've seen the promised land. I might not get there with you, but you will. Then he was killed the next day. And when he had reference to the promised land, he was talking about that old story out of the Bible, Moses. You probably remember that the Jews were kept as slaves in Egypt. And they were released and finally wandered and from place to place to place. And 
they got to this river. I think it may be the River Jordan. And they got there and they, was, and, and, they, and they looked across and they saw fertile fields and they call it the land of milk and honey. And there were people that lived there, but the land was, had plenty of open space. And as these little group of ragtag tribe got to that river, they looked across and decided, well, I guess we're going to go across there. And then yet, many among them were afraid. There were those that among them that said, you know, I don't think we fit in too well with those people over there. And maybe they won't like us. And several of them said, you know, let's just go back to Egypt. We know what slavery was all about. And, and we were comfortable there. And then they said, well, let's, maybe we should wander some more in the wilderness like we've been. And, it, and they did wander in the wilderness. They wandered for some... 40 years, if you know the story. And I was just thinking about that story because they finally did come up that river and they did cross it. But it took 40 years, and I was thinking that, you know, we're celebrating the 40th year of the death of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. And now we're coming up to that river as a nation. Election is being held in this country right now. Probably the results we'll know in the morning. And we have some pretty historic things happening. We have an African-American candidate that tomorrow may win two more states and will be the nominee. And we have a woman candidate, highly qualified. And these are the first times in history that we've had this to happen in America. And so we're kind of poised at this river. And the question is, can we build a bridge across this river? And can we take advantage of what Dr. King talked about when he talked about he wanted America to have what I think he called it the beloved community? where people could live together and can not be judged by the color of their skin or their gender or their ethnicity, but by the content of their character. I'm not sure if America will be able to rise above the systemic bias and prejudice that we have against both gender and race. That's up to history to tell us. But before we can take advantage of the opportunities that we were given in the American Civil Rights Movement, which preceded tremendous gains in the early women's rights movement and succeeded by other movements and gay rights movements, and then take it full advantage of the ability to have liberty and justice for all will be whether we can overcome some barriers. And one of those barriers is going to be whether we can trust, whether we can trust people who are different than us. Senator McCain is a very capable person, and I'm sure he'll run an honorable race against either Obama or Clinton. But there are people who, because of the laws, will be able to set up little private committees and raise millions of dollars, and they're going to try to undermine that trust. Like they did last time when Senator Kerry was running, and some groups decided that he wasn't really a war hero, that he didn't have the swift boat like they said. And so they manufactured a, a, a myth about that he was really a coward and all that, and it was none of the truth in it. And he ended up, uh, you know, they spent $10 million to prove that he was not the right kind of war hero. And he was running against a person who had no military experience whatsoever. But they... And already, we can see the rumblings of having Mr. Obama, Senator Obama, look like some kind of, you know, relative of Saddam Hussein. That's his middle name, and you saw recently a little bit of that on television. And then, they, then who knows what we're going to hear as somebody in this country 
wants to make us be sure that we don't build those bridges of trust. You know, each of you have a front row to the seats of history. It's easy to look back on history and say, wow, I wish I'd lived in the days of whenever, this movement, that movement, American Civil Rights Movement, the Women's Rights Movement. But honestly, the march for justice continues. And each of you have an opportunity to be a part of it. And in my day, so many of us sat on our seats and we didn't get out of that front row seat to history. We just watched. You got the opportunity to make a difference. There are a lot of barriers that separate us in this country today. And it's all happening at a time that we're making enormous changes in America. Politics, as usual, is probably not going to stay with us. We, Republicans are nominating a candidate that the Republicans don't like. And the reason they don't like him is because he doesn't represent the traditional mold of the people that he defeated in the primaries. And so they're having to come to grips with him rather grudgingly. You know, he, to his credit, is for working out something with the, I call them sharecroppers of the 21st century, the Latino migrants among us. He believes in working out something for a fair solution to the 12 or 15 million people that are making our economy flourish. And so is Mr. Obama, and so is Senator Clinton, Senator Obama, all. So it's not going to be politics as usual. And I don't think we're going to go back. But fear causes pardon me, I should say, put it in reverse, change causes enormous fear. We have 875 hate groups operating in the country today, and that's a 40% increase in the last, in five years, actually since 2000, so the last eight years, a 40% increase. And most of it is fueled by anti-Latino bias and prejudice. There's been a 40% increase in just five years alone in the hate crimes against Latinos in this country. And that's just one small group. The other thing that we've got to overcome while we're changing this country is a willingness to share power. And that's going to be tough. Because this nation, even though it's made up of all kinds of ethnic groups, 50% of our population in this country is women. And yet, the only presidents that we've ever elected to run this nation have been people from England, Ireland, and Scotland with little short names like Carter, Ford, Adams, Bush, you name it. There's never been a Jewish person, Italian, Greek. And only recently, there was an Irish Catholic. There's nobody. I mean, there's never been an African-American elected president because of this enormous fear of those of us who hold the economic power in our community, in our society, of relaxing the grip and trusting and sharing power with somebody who's different than us. I had an opportunity to, to really understand how America was changing a few years ago. I grew up in a small cotton farming community and everybody was either black or white. There was no, you know, we didn't know a Jewish person who existed in the area. And the blacks worked in the cotton fields and, and the whites ran the cotton farms. And that was about it in my little area. And I had an opportunity to, to see how America's changing. I had an I, was working on a, a case. I was suing the Ku Klux Klan for the lynching of a young black man down in Mobile, Alabama. They just picked him off the street for no good reason and lynched him. And I was working on that case when somebody found out that we were willing, I'd willing to take cases, Southern Poverty Law Center, against you know hate groups. And I got a call from a lawyer in Houston, Texas, and he represented some Vietnamese fishermen. He did some real estate work for them, transactions. And he said, can you come down here and help these people? He talked to me about the problem, and he said, you know, there was some 
50,000 Vietnamese immigrants who were settled in the Texas Galveston Bay area. They were refugees from the war in Vietnam, had they been killed if they stayed behind. There were some five or 600,000 brought to America and many into this area, this state. But about 50,000 were brought into the Houston and Galveston Bay area and they literally arrived with their clothes on their backs. They had no money and they were very industrious people so they went to work. And it wasn't long before they were taken over, the car wash business, the, a lot of the fruit stands, vegetable markets and fish markets and a whole bunch of other things. And now a small group of them, about 50, decided that they wanted to get some fishing boats and go fish like they did in the warm waters around Saigon Harbor. And they had no money to buy these big three and four hundred thousand dollar fishing trawlers. And there were some 1,200 of them operating up and down the coast owned by American fishermen. So they bought old broken down boats. Literally some of them were sunk in shallow harbors. And with the industry of hard work, they raised these boats, they patched them up, they fixed the engines, they fixed the nets, and they went out to fish. And within a year or so, they were out fishing the American fishermen. They got up early, they didn't come in till dark, they worked hard, they pooled their resources. And it wasn't long also that the American fishermen, I guess the best word was, they became jealous. And so the American fishing group called the American Fishermen Association had a thousand members. They went to the Texas legislature and they said, we want you to pass a law not to allow any more license to be given to these people. And the Texas legislature in its wisdom said, we can't do that. This is America. This is the free enterprise system. And so they refused to pass the law limiting fishing licenses. Well, a few of those American fishermen turned to the Ku Klux Klan. And their goal was to terrorize these fishermen so that they wouldn't take their boats out when the trimping season opened in April. The Klan had rallies and they burned some giant crosses and they burned a, a couple of fishing boats to kind of in effigy and actually burned a couple of real boats in the water and they couldn't trace down who did it, but it's pretty clear, to terrorize these people. And when I arrived down there at, at Kemer, Texas, where Clear Creek Channel comes out into the Gulf, near, near, near Houston. I saw all these little boats, there's about 40 or 50 of them, sitting in harbors docked, and they were just rocking kind of, you can imagine, in a wheelhouse, little small boats. And they had for sale signs, and because these fishermen decided that they're gonna sell their boats and just get out. They were terrorized by the Klan. After meeting with Nguyen Van Nam, the leader of the fishing group, and convincing them that there are laws in this country that protect, would protect them. I convinced them to file a lawsuit in federal court. And we were seeking an injunction. For you non-lawyers, that means we had asked the judge to issue an order against a whole bunch of Klansmen and American fishermen saying that if you go near and bother these fishermen, you'll be guilty of a crime, criminal contempt of court, and therefore you'll be put in prison. Well, we gathered our evidence in the Fishermen agreed to go along with this American, the Vietnamese people. And we gathered our evidence and, and the judge gave us a real quick hearing because shrimping season opened a week after we filed the lawsuit in court. On a Saturday night before Sunday, when we, a Monday before we was getting ready to go to court, I got a call from Nguyen Van Nam. He said, Mr. Dees, drop the lawsuit. I said, oh no, Nam, we can't drop the lawsuit. We can win this case, we can win it. And he said, no, I've been told by the leaders of the other businesses in this area, the Vietnamese, let Klan have fishing, we're out of here. I said, do you think that you give me an opportunity to talk to your fishing group tonight and the other leaders of the businesses in the community? And because I knew that if, if they wanted out, I'd have to tell the judge we're out of court. Well, that night, about seven o'clock, he had gathered together the fishermen and their families, and I was standing in a small Catholic church, room about this size, 75 or 80 Vietnamese people, many dressed in very clothes they wore to this country, very polite, dignified. And I said, you know, and I was talking through a Catholic priest who was interpreting, I said, you know, folks, America has laws to protect the minority against the majority if the majority is violating the law and breaking the law. 
I said, don't drop your lawsuit because if you do, then they're going to come after your other businesses. Don't cut and run. And I said, you know, I know you're afraid, but I'm going to tell you a story about another man and another movement at another time. You've probably never heard of this man. His name was Martin Luther King. He led his people at a very difficult time when the majority did violate their rights too. They were, they were African-American people, and their churches were bombed, and people were shot and killed. But, you know, had they not stuck by the American justice system and used its courts, they would not have gotten their rights as soon as they did. Please don't drop your lawsuit. Well, I left and went back to my hotel, and it was, I think it might have been Sunday morning or so, maybe later before I got a call. And... Mr. Nam Man Nam said, continue lawsuit. Well, we put on a good case, and we even had American fishermen who didn't like what they saw either, and they came and testified about the threats the Klan made about burning boats and moving, you know, threatening people and everything. We had a good case. And the judge issued a very strong and powerful injunction against about 50 named individuals and Klanmen and, and all that kind of stuff. And I was invited that Monday, next Monday morning to the blessing of the fleet down at Kemer, Texas where the docks were at where the boats would have to come out into the open waters to go fishing. I got there around oh I guess it was 530 in the morning the sun had still not come up the fog was hanging heavy over the bay and when I got there there was a Catholic priest standing on the dock and the families of the fishermen were on either side didn't hear any boats and couldn't see any, and in a few minutes I heard a little diesel engine, and then finally a boat popped out through the fog at the mouth of the channel and came by the reviewing stand, and the priest blessed the boat, and another, and another, until finally 15 or 20 boats had gone out to sea. The sun began to burn through the fog and began to get more light, and as I looked to my right, in my left, I could see the sun glistening off the badges of the United States Marshals, that's the police force of the courts, that were sent there to protect these fishermen and to enforce that court order. And as also as I looked to my right and my left, I could see enormous pride in the faces of these new Americans. At a time of great change in our nation, they were finding a place at America's table. And not just finding a place at America's table, they were helping build America's table for the benefit of all of us in this country. And I'd like to tell you, I not only felt proud to be a lawyer, I felt proud to be an American. And we're facing... We're facing some very drastic changes in this country that in some way might cause concern and fear among our people. Can we really elect a, an African-American president or can we elect Hillary Clinton president or are we really going to try to deal with this Latino issue that has been made such a political football where people on television like Lou Dobbs scream every night about open borders to ad nauseum? And we're talking about building a 700-mile fence along the border. This isn't the first time we've faced change in our country. As I told a group of students earlier today, when my people came to this country in 1840 to 1850 from Ireland, there was only 17 million people in America, and 2 million of my folks came here during that time, escaping starvation in Ireland. And when they came here, they represented a very large, much larger percentage of the population than the people who are coming in from Mexico and Guatemala and El Salvador. And they came here to fill jobs, but they, they met enormous resistance. In fact, some of the complaints against my people when they came here is that we didn't speak English. We spoke Cockney, which obviously, if you go to Ireland, you know, I've been back there before, it's kind of hard to know what they're saying. Also, they said, well, they bring diseases and all that kind of stuff. 
and that they are stealing American jobs. Actually, their mobs lynched several Irish people seeking jobs in Boston and New York and Philadelphia in 1840s and 50s. And I promise you, had I stood on this stage in 1845 during the height of that xenophobia and nativism, that attitudes that was being expressed, and I stood on this stage back then, an audience like this, and I said, well, let me tell you, I'm going to make a prediction that probably less than 100 years, one of the relatives, maybe the grandson of one of these Irish immigrants is going to become president of the United States. I would have been roundly booed and asked to leave. But that's what happened. And I predict that we're going to elect a leader of this country that's different than the other X number of presidents we've had. We are going to because America is changing. We're going to elect a woman soon. We're going to elect an African American. And there will be a Garcia or Hernandez president of this United States. It's going to happen. It's going to happen because America is a great nation. And it's not a nation that belongs to any one group of people. Not long ago, we began to look around this country to see what's really going on in our nation. We saw some horrible acts. We saw the increase in hate groups. We saw James Byrd drug behind a pickup truck to his death down in Texas. And as we, as we looked around the country to see what's going on, you know, and hate groups, and hate groups, and Timothy McVeigh had bombed the Oklahoma building, and all these other things, horrible things. Matthew Shepard was a student who was gay, was beaten to death at the University of, of Wyoming simply because of his sexual orientation. And as we went from community to community around the country, as part of our tolerance education program, we found that people around this country were saying, look, we're not like that. Small groups, college campuses, church groups, synagogues, mosques, uh, civic groups. They said, we saw people reaching out to victims of hatred and saying, we feel your pain. We want you to be a part of us and we want to be a part of you. And one story that I remember that stuck out so well, we heard lots of stories that our, our investigators brought back. One was from a little town in, in Montana. Not many Jewish people live there very few minorities, and in that town, a uh, family, a mother and father, bought their little son a Hanukkah, the candlestick used during Hanukkah. It has the candles on it. And this little boy was so proud of his candles, and he put those in a window on a table, and each night of Hanukkah, he lit a candle. And somebody in that town saw it, and they didn't like it either. And so they threw a brick through the window and knocked that Hanukkah candle to the floor. Well, there's another man in that community who didn't like what he saw either, and he was not Jewish. He was a businessman, and he had a furniture store, and he took the letters down on the outside of his marquee that advertised his products, and in that place he had put, not in our town. And he organized the police department, the schools, the churches, the, all the other groups there in the town, and the, and the newspaper, and they made cardboard Hanukkahs. And they had one placed in the window, of each house and town that faced the street. When this campaign was going on, this mother and father took their little boy around to see. And as he was, he was an after supper at night, and was, he could see these Hanukkah candles backlit from the house lights inside. And he turned to his mom as they drove up one street and down another. He said, Mom, I didn't know so many Jews lived in Billings. And she said, no, son, they're our friends. And I think therein lies the answer. If we're going to build these bridges across the divide that separates this country, whether they be along race, gender, sexual orientation, you know, and especially along the economic divide that separates us along class and economic lines of this country, it's going to be because we reach across those divides and learn to care about and love people who are different than we are. 
And that's easier said than done, and you'll see it in the next general election because we're going to be tested as a nation. Dr. Martin Luther King had serious doubts about whether this country would continue at a very difficult time when 12 million African Americans were treated less than second class all over this nation. It wasn't just in the South. There was more violence in the Boston school desegregation case than in Birmingham, Alabama. And you know, Dr. King was very worried that our democracy would continue. And he, he told us an old story at the time. I remember hearing him several times tell this story. It was a story about another nation, a nation that no longer existed, a nation that had great promise, and a nation that kind of varied from the promises that it had. And I think he told us this story as a warning for us about our country. The year was 900 BC. The Jews, the children of Israel had wandered, and as I told you, up to that river. And finally they crossed that river and entered that promised land, so to speak, and they built a great city. They built high walls around this city to protect it, and those people on the inside got nice building lots and built beautiful homes. They had banks, a school system, a court system, very much like today. And in the middle of this great city, they had a marketplace where people from far and wide brought their products in to sell. And there was a farmer who came from outside this village from another town, another little farming village, and with his wagon laden with goods for his stall in the market. And he always got to those big gates about daylight in the morning. And he, when he got there waiting for the gates to open, he saw things that really bothered him. He saw able-bodied men and women reaching out begging for a few grains from his wagon. And upon inquiry, he learned that, well, if you wasn't a member of the right group, you didn't get a job. If you got one, it wasn't a good job to feed your family. And then when he got in the marketplace and put his stuff out, he heard grumbling from the people that walked by his stall. And he learned that, well, sometimes you got arrested where other people didn't get arrested, or you went to court and you didn't get good treatment, it was because of which group you were part of. And this bothered this farmer because he knew the trials and tribulations of people, and he knew the great promises of this great city. And he was a man of some means and reputation in his community, so he asked if he could address the leaders of that town, so like the town council, so to speak. And they gave him that opportunity. I think most of you know who this farmer was. He was a biblical prophet, Amos. And Amos stood before these leaders of that ancient city and he said, you know folks, y'all got a good thing going here. But unless you're fair to all the people among you, the least among you, unless you give them an equal opportunity, you're not going to get to keep what you have and pass down to future generations. It's going to be taken away from you. You have no inherent right to all this wealth you have here. You have to earn it fairly. And he said, unless you're fair to all the people, I predict that one day there won't be one stone left upon another of this great city. And Amos spoke to those people in the words that Martin Luther King spoke to us in the days of the American Civil Rights Movement. Amos said, don't be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. That's where we are today. And the bottom line is a simple thing called justice. And I know that you people in this community, in this prosperous area of this state, will take to heart the words of Amos and Dr. King and all those people who fought for economic justice and I know that once you graduate from here, you'll scatter to all parts of this country, and you'll have an opportunity to, to make a difference. And I know that you truly won't be satisfied either until justice rolls down like waters. And one day, when myself and my grayish hair and all the rest of people of my generation are gone and you're living out your time, somebody's going to write a book about your times. Maybe one of you. And I predict 
that it'll be a book about America's greatest generation because I have faith in you to get the job done. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I know we got some. I know if you have to leave, I understand. Uh, if we have some time for questions, and I think we got some books to sign, I'll sign them up here or wherever they got them. But I, before we do that, I take some time for some questions, and uh, you get you don't touch them. Okay. Okay, I'll wait just a second. Let, let me say this: uh, uh, I can probably hear you better than a microphone, but. I, she asked me to talk about a couple of our major cases. I talked about one, and I don't want to get too personal and talk about a whole lot of cases, but I might work one in here or there. But I know it's, it's getting late, and I know some of you have to go. But if, let, me, let me hear some questions from students if you got one. Because what usually happens, I usually get up, and, and after everything's over, then I end up, i uh, got to get 50 questions from somebody who walks up front. So I'm glad to try to answer them. I'll, I'll, talk, I'll answer questions about stuff I didn't even talk about. Do my best. Yes, ma'am. I can be loud, actually. Just, just speak out. I'll, re I'll repeat the question. Don't worry. Yes, ma'am. Um, you're talking about how this country has changed atmosphere. Do you think this country is ready for female president or an African American president? A female or an African American president? Do you think our country is ready for one? Sorry, would you speak that again? Do you think our country is ready for an African American president or a female president? Well, if, if you look at the enormous movement that Senator Obama has created, raising last month over $50 million from small donors on the Internet, he certainly, you would think that if the people that he has energized, young people and others across this country, that it appears that we are ready for an enormous change in this country. I think, I think that the answer could be yes. We're facing a time of a great crisis in the world. The United States dollar is worth gets worth less and less every day. The price of oil is being, is naturally people won't pay in euros, not dollars, and that causes the dollar drops every week. And so the oil goes up, not because they can't find more oil, but because the dollar's not worth much. So I mean, this country's got a lot of problems. Uh, we got a subprime mortgage debacle. People have less than two checks from bankruptcy. So, I mean, if we, if the Democrats, and I, you know, I'm traditionally a Democrat, so I'm not talking against Republicans, but if the Democrats can't win an election under those circumstances with the war that is highly questionable whether we should have ever been there in the first place, and, you know, it probably didn't further the American interests, then, you know, I don't think you can ever win. But then, on the other hand, you've got, you've got the perfect storm in front of us here. You've got two candidates, the leading candidates, a woman and an African-American, and America's never elected either types of those candidates. Uh, you know, and I, uh, it's past Mr. McCain's bedtime now, but uh, I don't know what, I don't know exactly what we're going to do. I think that, you know, if he can stay awake to the, to November and, and we can, uh, I know I'm prejudiced here, <laughs> but now he has some good points. You know? some, some of my best friends are Republicans, don't get me wrong. But no, I think I think we can answer your question. I think we can. No, you know, humor aside, I think we can, and I think it, I think there's a, it's a time in this country that if, if if those people who have the same economic and political interests will join hands together, we can. But throughout history, populist movements have never succeeded in this nation. The the black tenant farmers, the sharecroppers, black and white, could not get together to overcome the oppression they felt. The powers to be turn them against each other, and they turn the blacks against the whites, and that's classic history of how the power structure does it. And I think that you're going to see that now because uh, both candidates want to reduce the cost of drugs to the public. Canada and other countries seem to get them to us a lot cheaper, and the he the whole medical care system, you know, we we it's all all a tragedy. Well, I think that the powers to be though are going to try to pit different groups within this
population of ours against each other so that they can stay in power and keep their economic power. And I think you're going to see that tried to the max. This election, there's probably going to be a billion dollars spent in this general election because more than that's at stake uh, for these giant, you know, corporations. And I have nothing against corporations. I ran a very big company, and corporations' bottom line is the people they serve. There's nothing wrong with that. But I think that, that uh, unregulated greed has cost this country an enormous uh, amount of, of, of uh, disrespect in the eyes of the world. So if, if there's ever been a time for this to happen, I think it's now. Yes, sir. Well, that's always an issue. The question is whether whoever wins can keep our people united. America is a, you know, is a country where when the election's over and they shake hands and we, we continue on, we don't have violence like in many other countries. And I think that will happen. Uh, you would think that the election would be one-sided with all the problems this nation's having, but it probably won't be. It'll probably be separated by a percentage point or two. So there's obviously great division. And, you know, and, and either side will be jockeying to take advantage of some minute thing and blow it, blow it extremely out of proportion. So who knows when November comes what the public will think about any of the candidates. And that, that could be, you know, it's a, it's a long time. It's like a lifetime in history, that, that amount of time with America's 24-7 news, and et cetera. But I, I, I do think that, you know, I have great faith in this country because of young people like that are here tonight and they're all over the country uh, who are really, really eager to be a part of the greatness of this nation. And, you know, we live in a world without borders now. Uh, you know, our cars are made in, you know, foreign countries, and some of those countries have come here and, and built factories. Uh, we do, we're getting from China an enormous amount of our manufactured goods. And so it's not like we can just build barriers up at the border. It's just not going to happen. And so, so we're not only dealing with a, a national issue, we're dealing with a world issue, and a world economic and a world geopolitical issue. We need a president of this country who's above our national interests and can look out there because we look to for leadership. We need a president who would uh, try to persuade other countries that it's in their best interest to do things like deal with global pollution or deal with human rights issues or deal with child labor or deal with toxic stuff, you name it. But we can't at the barrel of a gun force our concepts of democracy on the rest of the world. It just will not happen, and it should not happen. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Children's March, etc., and it is, it's wonderful, and I want to thank you for that. And I also want to ask you if you uh, have had the, um, the dubious pleasure of uh, meeting uh, and sitting with our uh, current president and what that was like. Our current president? A current president, yes. Oh, you mean president. president Bush? Yes. Oh, no, I haven't had the opportunity to meet President Bush. I would certainly like to, but I haven't. Uh, I was President Carter's finance director when he ran for president. He was a great president. And I was George McGovern's national finance director when he ran for president. And uh, that's my closest connection to politics. Yes, uh, right, right back there on the back, I see a student's hand up. Awesome. You, you look like a student. Yeah, I'm a student. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> sick. I had a question. Um, obviously, you're a very compassionate guy, and uh, you're down with the whole social justice thing. I was wondering, um, do you have an opinion on animal rights? Does that affect you at all? I'm serious. Sure, sure. Uh, I understand. I understand what you're asking. It, it's just not, a, it's not an issue that, we, that we've organized to deal with, but certainly I'm interested in animal rights. I've helped Peter uh, and group to protect animals, and uh, I think we're all shocked by what we saw on television today with one of our United States Marines pitching a dog, a small puppy, a great distance into a valley. I don't know if anybody saw that or not. It's, uh, I just happened to be hanging around a hotel all day waiting to come here, and I was on a treadmill, 
and it was, it's an awful scene. So, you know, it, uh, it's just horrible. Yeah, you know, we got, uh, I, I was raised on a big farm, you know, I have 800 head of cattle and hogs and chickens and pigs, you name it, and pets, and, and uh, so I understand. Yeah, I mean, I'm strongly on the side of animal rights, but it's just not enough thing we've ever dealt with. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I too am an educator. And uh, don't talk so close to the microphone because you know that not a little close than that. I just I just don't hear well. Okay, it is it all I gets muffled when you talk right into the microphone. Yes, ma'am. This? Is this okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I've been in and out of classrooms for forty years, and a member of the Southern Poverty Law Center for about nineteen years, and the teaching materials they give to teachers are the most extraordinary epiphanies that have ever happened in any of my history government classrooms. A special, a place at the table kept hundreds of kids spellbound. And if that kind of film could go not just to high schools, but in every single classroom, I think there would be a difference. <clears throat> it's an honor to have it here. Well, the re thank you. The, re the reason that we started teaching tolerance, to teach acceptance and tolerance, was because we realized that you can't fight only, you can, do more, you can fight hate in the courtroom, and that's exhilarating to put the bad guys out of business. But it's as important to teach acceptance and tolerance in the classroom. There are 80,000 schools in this country, and that's most of them, K through 12 that use our material in colleges also. We have 600,000 teachers that get Teaching Tolerance magazine. It varies from time to time, but, and it's a free subscription to, to teachers. It's just not for the general public. And you can read it, everything online. Uh, and I don't say this to brag, but we put a lot into Teaching Tolerance. We have three films that have won Oscars that are part of our different teaching kits and two Oscar nominations. So we try to make really good things that hold your attention. And the next teaching kit that Teaching Tolerance is doing, it, we're going to tell the story of the grape strike, Cesar Chavez and his group that did it in California, to tell the Latino story. And we're going to use that to tell the Latino story in America. And I think it's going to be an exceptional, exceptional project. Uh, Dolores Huerta, who's uh, still alive, and she was a partner with Cesar Chavez in this movement, is going to be part of this, part of this film. And we'll have, we hope to have that out within the next, next year. Yes, sir. Uh, hello. Um, you mentioned uh, economic justice hand in hand with social justice and a number of uh, examples to illustrate that. I'm surprised that you haven't talked more about the uh, decades following World War II with all of the union organizing activity, successful activity, coinciding with the social justice activities and a corresponding uh, decline in our um, our union in terms of uh, our own humanity with the decline of the unions uh, starting with the 80s. You mentioned slightly um, the, uh, the, labor, um, <clears throat> the labor issue that Martin Luther King uh, was uh, uh, endorsing in Memphis and also you just mentioned uh, the UFW, but <clears throat> as I recall, uh, the union activities during the uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s were very strong. Those people would do anything to make sure that the corporations paid for the blood off their back. And uh, that was very similar to the people who um, rallied around civil rights issues in the 50s and 60s. They would not take no for an answer. So I'm just curious why you haven't mentioned that. Well, well th th thank you for your comments. Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't mention the unions. I sh you certainly could have as part of the economic justice country because if I had time to tell you my favorite Clarence Darrow story, I'd tell you a story about his representing a union person. And uh, it's quite a compelling and touching story, but this is 1915 or 18. A lot of things happened in the American economic system, and I'm sure some of you are way ahead of me on this one, but enormous technology has ended up taking jobs away from people. NAFTA and other trade, you know, take these, taking these jobs overseas. Unions have been weakened in this country to a great degree. Some unions, like the uh, uh, hotel workers and others, and some of them are pretty strong. The auto workers have had enormous problems because the auto industry itself, for when 
Chrysler and in this country are having, you know, serious e economic problems. So I'm not an expert on why the unions aren't as strong today and why they don't walk hand in hand with the, the civil and human rights issues. I do know that, that unions in this country, as some of the strongest ones, have endorsed either Clinton or Obama. And they're, and they're some of the largest PAC contributors in the country still. Uh, the American Civil Rights Movement was a, a glorious day in justice and seeking justice in this country, and many people joined in that movement, including the Jewish community nationwide, and has developed kind of a schism between the African American and Jewish community over the last, you know, 10 years. You raised an interesting question. I wish I had some answers for you, but uh, thank you for your comments. Yes. But just one more. I'll be sitting up here for a second. Yes, ma'am. Uh, when your book first came out, uh, you did an interview in which you said at the time that there were believed to be between 75 and 100 hate groups in this country. Wait, that'd be what now? Uh, in 1991, you, you said that there were the, the, the Southern Poverty Law Center knew of 75 to 100 hate groups at that time. Right. And as of this week, what I also got in my mail was uh, 888. Right. And I'm wondering if you would speak to the part that the internet plays in perpetuating these hate groups. Well, first of all, I don't remember exactly. I think what I was talking about when my, this book, this is a different book than that one. It's been rewritten and redone. But when, the, when Season for Justice came out in 1991 or so, you have a good memory. Uh, I was talking about 75 to 150 patriot groups, not hate groups, not like Klan groups and neo-Nazi and skinhead groups. There were that many, and it kind of built until 1990. It seems like it hadn't been that long, but 90, when was Oklahoma City, 94, 90, 94, 95? And that's when it reached its height of so-called patriot groups in the country. They've declined substantially. Uh, the, internet, the Internet is the virtual group. And quickly, uh, as it is with anything, if you're looking to grow roses, you don't go to your local garden club much anymore. You pop in the name of your rose in Google and you find which fertilizer you want, and so you get the answer right there. And, uh, and that's the same with about everything. Young people today can get on the Internet, and before you know it, a young person, 18, 20 years old, 15 maybe, who would never, couldn't even find a hate group if they tried to. They wouldn't know how to find a Klan group or a skinhead group or a Neo Nazi group, you name it, they can log in and they can be on a, a website like Stormfront. Check it out sometimes, and they can and they can be uh, uh, putting in uh, chat rooms and uh, ch emailing other people. And before you know it, a kid in Alabama is talking to one, in Panaluma is talking to one, in San Diego, and you have a virtual group. And these people are there, you know, frustrated, angry, fearful, uh, in in and they're getting fed some of the rankest, racist, homophobic material that you can imagine, and they're downloading this material. An example of how powerful the Internet is is a giant hate group. That's about 800 hate websites on the Internet today, unconnected with Klan groups or anything like that. Some of them are, some of them aren't. Is look at Timothy McVeigh. I mean, he's a poster child for the Internet. He started when it's just beginning, and he downloaded the copies of the Turner Diaries, a fictional account of a race war in America. And in it, it's, this race war started when a group of people like him, uh, so-called patriots, filled a truck with ammonium nitrate and drove it up in front of a federal building and blew it up in Washington, D.C. And the book used 4,000 pounds of ammonium nitrate like he did, et cetera, et cetera. He got this strictly off the Internet. He was a loner, and he just felt like he'd been so... Uh, indoctrinated with all this stuff, that he felt he had to act. If he didn't act, America was going to go to hell in the handbasket. And when he was arrested by the state trooper who caught him, you know, 50, 60 miles from the scene, not knowing he was the bomber, uh, on the back seat of his car, his license tag had fallen off. That's how he got caught. And on the back seat of his car was the was the stuff that he had, the Turner Diaries, this thing, internet publication, and he had underlined exactly the things that he did. And that was Exhibit One at his trial. So the internet is got good uses, it's got bad uses. It's nothing but another form of communications. And it, can, and it can be used by all of us for good as well as evil. And the hate groups certainly are very sophisticated. They have to have no investment hardly. 
they don't have to have a mailing list. And, uh, and Stormfront has like probably a couple of million hits a month, maybe more than that. But th I know you've got a lot of questions, and I, I, I don't mind taking longer. And uh, it's some question from a student here. Just a second. Okay. Can you hear me? Just speak up, Jenny. That's a good thing to end on. <laughs> well, there, you know, I'm not uh, sure. The, the Klan burned our building in 1983 after we had a case that represented the woman that lost her son to a Klansman's news. And they burned our building. And two, two years later, the FBI caught the Klan leader, who was a fire chief in a small town. And he put, he put a couple of guys up to it, uh, to doing it, so they caught him. There, uh, there are 40, so about 43 or 4 people that have been put in prison or in, in there right now have been for attempts to harm, you know, people that work at the center, to blow our building up, you name it. Uh, so a couple in California, actually, and uh, we're doing a trial and somebody was going to blow us up out here. And in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, we had the same problem when we sued the Aryan Nations out there and took it when they were beating up some people. And we took their 20-acre compound for a victim. So they didn't like that too well. Uh, so, you know, uh, yeah, we've had some problems, and, uh, and I didn't get into this, and the other lawyers at the center, and, you know, we have a lot of people other than myself, you know, I don't mean to use I, and I that, that I do this all, but, you know, you just can't say time out in the middle of something. You just have to continue on. We have good security. Law enforcement is enormously helpful to us. We have major law enforcement problem projects in the country. We have a training education for law enforcement. They get online credit. Uh, we have a, a magazine that goes to about 55,000 police agencies and individuals called the Intelligence Report that tracks hate groups and talks about what they're doing. So we've got enormous support from the FBI and all agencies. So that, that helps us go. But, you know, uh, has it changed my lifestyle? Gosh, I don't know. Sometimes we get a lot of threats and, uh, uh, you know, and sometimes we have to have, you know, guards. They're always around my house all the time. You know, you look out the window any time of night, three in the morning, they're walking around out there, you know. But sometimes, uh, you know, if I don't have windows I can close too well, you know. So, uh, so, so sometimes my wife and I can't do things on the pool table we used to. <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> Not much more to say after that. Um, Morris will still be here to, to sign books and posters and chat with people individually. If you would like to purchase a book, you can do so over here at the front, your front left, and come up to the stage. He'll sign the book for you, and you'll just proceed through the evening. If you're leaving, travel safely. Thank you, everyone, for coming this evening.